We're up to our entire interview with Alan Parsons. He's a man of few words, I'll say that. He has a real dry sensibility, but man, is he an interesting cat. Look at the Alan Parsons project. I mean, he's doing the Alan Parsons Live project now, and Alan Parsons is a solo artist with a brand new album called From the New World. There's also a new box set. They've remastered the entire Alan Parsons project discography, all the studio albums, and there's links in the description where you can pick it up. They're all there. Tales of Mystery and Imagination, I, Robot, Pyramid, Eve, The Turn of a Friendly Card, Eye in the Sky, Ammonia Avenue, and all the albums. Here's our entire chat with the great Alan Parsons. Congratulations, by the way, on the uh, the box set. There's something about when someone re either remasters something or else you've got this box set. It's an amalgamation of a blood, sweat, and tears, a younger self. How did it feel like having putting this together? Um, it felt great. Um, it was uh, it was a labor of love, I'll tell you, to to try and locate all the tapes. I mean, you know, 40 years worth of tapes, uh, they, they tend to go walk about and... Uh, we we went to a lot of trouble to make sure that uh, we we found you know the best sounding tapes, the most original tapes, so on and so. On. When you did the first album, and I'm guessing here because I've not read this, when you did the Tales of Mystery and Imagination, did were you just going, oh, let's just do a concept on this first one? There wasn't was there a plan of going, we're going to do this all the way across? I I, th I think concept albums were fashionable back in the late seventies, early eighties. So we we fitted into a uh, an area of progressive rock which included concept albums. I, mean, I felt good about it. Uh, I think in later years it became you know oh no not another concept album you know. Uh, but you know I, I I always felt good about um, having a, a theme to write songs about. You know um, it, it actually makes it makes the job easier. I thought of Days of Future Past when 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 the first album came out. I remember thinking, I'm not. I wonder if he's a Moody Blues fan because that's an early prog, early concept. Uh, was that a part of your your record collection at any point? Oh, I was very very into the Moody Blues. Yeah, um, in fact, I was uh, I was playing in a band just just before I got the job at Abbey Road when that album came out, and uh, everybody said, "Wow, Moody Blues! They've they've come up with this." Uh, incredible new sound and uh yeah it, it was great um while you mentioned the moody blues um they were meant to deliver instead of days of future past an album based on vorjak's new world symphony and i've just uh, released an album which included uh, a a, a well-known uh, song from the uh, taken you know borrowed from the album uh, it was actually one of vorjak's uh, Training uh, one of his uh, students that uh, wrote a song based on the on the slow movement in the symphony, and I I put that on the album. The, this tune was used for a, for a brown bread commercial product called Hovis, uh, and so everybody knows the tune in in the UK. So, oh, is um, that right? Yeah. Well, with the with the with the music thing of you putting out new new, new music as well. I remember when Roger Daltrey a few years ago, and of course they eventually did record some new music. Roger Daltrey says, well, no one buys new music anymore. And I remember uh, all my friends were saying, yeah, but we want, just because radio doesn't play the classic, new classic rock music, we still want to hear it. What's your take on that? Is there still, because I never understood the Billy Joel thing. I'm going, what do you mean? He says he has music inside of him, but he doesn't release music. But I mean, there's music in your head all the time, I would guess. Yes, I mean, uh, and I've I've got a a lovely uh, up to date studio to to record stuff in. Um, I've, I've actually been um, concentrating more on uh, on remixing uh, the past products and live live stuff. I mean, uh, do it, playing playing live and recording uh, recording live albums and post producing live albums has taken up a lot of time. Um, I, I I think. I think you're right. People um, aren't, aren't as interested in, in new music as they used to be. But um, I'm really pleased to see the uh, upsurge of vinyl because that, that means that people are going for quality again and, um, you know, spending good money and, and they don't mind getting up halfway through each, uh, <laughs> each album to turn it over you know um who was it uh, someone had once told me that was eric was the reason you guys didn't tour but why, why wasn't the band touring in the 80s 
Um, there was just no interest um, uh, on Eric's part, and my my role was uh, yet to be defined in the in, in, in the uh, live uh, situations. Uh, I didn't realize I could play guitar well enough to, to be the, the rhythm guitarist. <laughs> and uh, I really didn't have any aspirations towards singing either. But uh, when we made an album in the uh, mid-90s called Try Anything Once, that, that all changed. And, I, and I, uh, I was no longer working with Eric for, for, for reasons, uh, um, for non-creative reasons. It was, all, it was purely a, a, a court battle that, that prevented us working together. Uh, I just decided to make an album uh, with the individuals that had been involved in the uh, in the earlier projects: Ian Benson, Stuart Elliott, Andrew Powell. And that album was called "Try Anything Once," and then we decided that uh, we would support that record with uh, with with some live shows. And that, that was the that was the birth of the uh, of the live of the Alan Parsons live project, as it were. Was it hard to turn down Pink Floyd for "Wish You Were Here"? Or, were you, or was your vision, you just had to do this Alan Parsons project? I mean, um, it, it turned out, it was a very diff difficult decision to make because it was a, a generous, generous offer by Pink Floyd and uh, obviously uh, high profile because of the success of Dark Side of the Moon. But it turned out to be the right decision. Um, I, I started having hits almost immediately, uh, having made the decision not to, uh, not to work with Pink Floyd. Um, I, had, I had hits with Pilot, with Cockney Reb, uh, Steve Harley, Cockney Rebel, and John Miles. Uh, all, uh, I mean, two, two number ones in the UK, two consecutive number ones in the UK. Well, speaking of music and John Miles, I li uh, when I remember I, that has Alan Parsons all over it. I mean, that that I listen to that and I'm going that that could have been an Alan Parsons project song. I mean, because it, it's sweeping, it's huge, it grabs you, grab, grabs you by the jugular and say. Take a listen to this. Did that do well in Canada? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the difficulty uh, that uh, the proms have in Belgium um, since uh, John's untimely death a few months back, um, they have to decide whether to include music in the, in the, uh, in the, in the proms program because uh, it, it, it's, over the years it's become a sort of anthem. And uh, the difficulty is that John had indicated he wasn't, he would, he would not be happy with it being included after his death. But anyway, we'll see. I, I think they may, they may, uh, they may decide to use uh, at least a clip or two uh, from a, pre a previous year. I think it will work great. Well, Live he, orchestra, John, oh and God. John, John yeah. on tape. Yeah. So, how, how much of a part of uh, how much? Uh, I mean, he's down as a sole songwriter. And and I'm not I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I'm going. I'm hearing a lot of Alan Parsons in this. But oh, uh, 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 I, I think it was a fairly typical uh, <laughs> production on my part. Um, there's there's an interesting uh, there's another link to the Moody Blues that here with with music. Interesting, you know, there, there's a section that goes da 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 da, and then the strings go da 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 da. Yes, and John originally wrote da 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 da, which is Nights in White Saturn. So I, <laughs> I had to get, get Andrew Powell to change just one note so that it uh, didn't sound like Nights in White Saturn. Uh, he hadn't, he, John hadn't figured it out. He, he hadn't heard that or hadn't noticed that. But <laughs> I'm glad we did because probably would have got sued otherwise. Getting the, the gig at Abbey Road, I mean, here you were 19 years old. That just doesn't happen. Were you naive enough to not be nervous or were you, were you, because when you're young, you don't know what you don't know. But at the same time, you did get that gig. I'd been working for EMI since 16, uh, at their uh, West London uh, facilities uh, in Hayes. Um, it was, yes, it was, it was a magical, a magical moment. Getting the, getting the job was a magical moment. And uh, I, uh, I totally adored uh, the, my early early years there, and uh, I developed into you know I d developed my engineering skills very quickly. Um, it didn't take long before I was actually you know recording a recording engineer, uh, just just literally by watching others. That was the that was the training scheme. It was literally just being a fly on the wall watching watching the other engineers at work. Did you see the Peter Jackson finished product of the uh, the, the documentary? Of course. Um, um, in fact, I met Peter Jackson uh, 
probably six months before the release of the film. And uh, he told me that he'd found some some shots of me which weren't included in the in the original. And he very kindly included them and even put my name on the screen. So I was absolutely delighted. So, yeah. Do, do you sometimes get little old me syndrome where were you? I mean, you know, Paul McCartney will sometimes say, oh, you know, he'll hear the Beatles in the background go, oh, they were a good little band. I'm going, how can he be objective? How? But can you sometimes when you hear yourself, is there a part of yourself that goes, was that me? Because you were all over the place. You've done so many different things. You know, it's like a radio guy who does every shift at a radio station. You were kind of like that. Uh, do you get that at all? Or do you, do you, uh, can you have perspective on listening to your stuff? I mean, that's a loaded question. There's a lot of things in there, but. <laughs> it's never ceased to amaze me how people say that's, um, that sounds like Alan Parsons or that that's clearly an Alan Parsons production. I don't hear it. I, I just uh, work on instinct and uh, just, you know, go through uh, the production of a song or a, or an instrumental, whatever it is, uh, just to saying, well, I think it needs this, it needs that. Uh, but uh, I, I really don't, I, I don't know why I seem to have this mysterious identity in, in the work I do. I, I, I just don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't feel it. I don't, I don't no notice it. You touched on something. I, I talked to Bruce Hornsby a few years ago and, and I remember telling him, and we know, yeah, he's one of those guys who practice 10 hours a day. He used to. And I said, well, I can tell you, I can tell when you're on a track, like the end of the innocence, I knew that was you. He said, oh, I don't like that. I said, I don't want to be that because he's afraid <laughs> of, you know what I mean? You can understand from being, from what you do. He says, well, I'd rather you not know who it is because you kind of touched on it there a little bit saying that's an Alan Parsons. Pr do you not want that or do you even care? Oh, no, I'm perfectly happy with it. <laughs> I, I don't mind if, uh, if people recognize uh, my work. Um, well, one one slight frustration, though, which is sort of in in contrast to that, is um, the uh, the what what has become known as the Bulls theme or the Michael Jordan theme. I think a lot of people don't realize that that's uh, the intro to "And the Sky" by the Alan Parsons Project. Um, it's just become known as as uh, as an anthem for uh, for sports events, you know. But uh, yeah, that, that's that's getting better. People <laughs> over the years, people have have realized it, it, that it is one of mine. So, well, now fun. and then there, there's a song that's bigger than that. It, that has gotten a life of its own. Though. That's but serious. You're talking about, right? Yeah, yes. uh, yeah. It's got a life of its. It's like it's on a whole other planet almost. It's like it's come, come went out of your universe and created its own universe or something. Arthur Brown. Arthur Brown, like, I mean, obviously, I didn't know who that was back in uh, when when I Robot, uh, no, uh, Tales of Mystery came out. I, I I looked him up because of the way he sang. I went, oh, my God, who is this guy? Was wh how, Did you go back with him? And it was his reputation in that studio? Because he's just this larger than life, literally colorful man. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, he, his big hit um, was a, a few years before. Um, Tells the mystery, um, a song called Fire. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, everybody knew him for that. And he, he, uh, he had a reputation <laughs> setting, setting fire to his headdress, like that, um, mm -hmm. uh, when he played live. And I mean, it's just, he, he's the most down to earth guy you could possibly imagine if you actually meet him face to face. But his persona on stage is, and in the studio is something else. And when we played in the song, uh, Telltale Heart, he sort of was like, oh, that's, yeah, mm -hmm. I think I've got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, play, play, me one, one, play it to me one more time. We did. And then he went into the studio, go on the mic, and then suddenly he becomes the the crazy world of Arthur Brown that we know and love. You know, and he was you know, throwing his hands around in the air and screaming and shouting. It was, it was an amazing experience. And, uh, you know, two takes, we had it. It was great. Uh, Lenny Zakatek told me, uh, he said, when I said, what was it like working with Alan? Did he give you a lot of direction? I, I want your take on this. He says, well, and by the way, I noticed you pick a lot of vocalists who know how to phrase damn well, because you, you, they'll have this bouncy, like when Lenny was, there was, uh, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I noticed that they, they just really have that pocket of knowing how to phrase uh, in their music. Is that a conscious thing? Or are you just like a, the way a guy sing or he's from the back? Ba your background how do you pick I, them? I, I was actually surprised to hear lenny say say that uh, i didn't give him much direction i mean he's very talented of course i mean uh, 
and he he knows how to uh, frame a song uh, with his vocal talents. But um, I, I always had uh, some some input with all, all singers. You know, um, you know, you know, I think you're singing too hard, or I think yes, you could you could uh, emphasize this word more, or uh, or phrase this the, this line slightly differently, and so on. Uh, but you know, I'm not a dictator. I'm, I, I, I don't like to be considered a dictator in the studio. I, I love to give people creative freedom. And, um, you know, the recording is a team effort. Uh, not, not only the singers, but the band and, and the, the writers, of course. Um, it, it's all a, all a conglomeration of uh, various areas of talent. Well, for instance, a Telltale Heart with Arthur, and I don't want to go home is the song I was thinking about with, with Lenny. I mean, he is stretching it. Like, he's stretching it on that song. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I'd never been born when he's singing that line. Um, those are, there, there's there's a few moments in Alan Parsons where you get the singer, he's like on a freaking mountaintop proclaiming whatever he's saying, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I, I felt that John Mars was one of those one of those talents. And yes. He, he, he just... He just nailed every song we, we gave him. It was, it was great. By the way, John Miles, to you, I'm kind of curious because he's an enigma to me because I didn't know that much about him. Uh, Sympathy, I love that album, by the way. Just love that album. But to you, John Miles was, what do you, how do you describe John Miles? Um, just the most musical guy I've ever known. Um, great, great keyboard player, great guitar player, great singer. And uh, the nicest guy you could ever ever imagined it was a huge loss to that, that, that we lost him this year very sad it's, i robot so did did eric actually talk to isaac asimov i think he did um it uh, it turned out that uh asimov had had already sold the rights to uh to uh, one of the film companies <laughs> and it took forever and ever it took you know, decades to for a film to appear um which I thought was incredibly disappointing. I thought it, I thought the movie of iRobot was not not good at all, my, my, in my view. view. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about concept albums. Our, our concept was uh, very different to to Asimov's. We uh, we kind of maintained through the through the lyrics of the songs that uh, that. Uh, Man and machine did not work very well together, and that uh, man, uh, that machine would eventually destroy man because of our misgivings. And you, what's your thoughts on that now, twenty twenty two? I think we're in serious trouble. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, robots are uh, are very much with us, um, very, very, very much a part of our lives these days. AI is uh, is a worry to me. Yeah. The song "I Robot." I play that for the younger generation a lot. If I'm surrounded by people and I'm able to be the guy who plays the music, I'll play that. And we touched on it when we talked last time. I said, you, you kind of kept putting layers on that, right? And you said, yeah, that's how we kind of build it. But there's, I don't remember ever playing that song at a party. I play that song at parties. And Which everyone song? would, Which I, song the, the, the opening of iRobot. Uh -huh. and, and never once has, has no one said, what is that? Every time someone will turn around if they haven't heard it and turn around and say, because, yeah, of course, it's the ultimate building song. I've once called it in a review the most interesting song I've ever I've ever heard in my life. And uh, I, always get, I always get confused when people say song when it's an instrumental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it was um, it was it was different for its time. It was uh, I, I think it was sort of. Uh, just in time to catch the uh, the the disco movement, um, and uh, also at the same time as uh, as the uh, punk movement, which uh, thank goodness uh, people <laughs> either went with progressive rock or with punk. <laughs> I'm I'm pleased to say that uh, our fans went with us, <laughs> or I'm I'm relieved that uh, <laughs> our fans went with us. It was an interesting time, uh, you know, seventy six, seventy seven, seventy eight that period. Well, how different was Tales of Mystery and iRobot to make? How because your doc see for you the first album is not like you've you've taken you've had so much so much experience going into Tales of Mystery and Imagination. But what was it? What was different about actually putting writing doing that first album as opposed to iRobot the second? Was there anything different about it? Um, 
I, I, I think we had a, a degree of confidence that uh, with the, the success of the first album that we would, we would be doing okay. Uh, you know, it wasn't a complete shot in the dark and we'd, we'd uh, done a multi-album record deal with Clive Davis for, for, from, for iRobot onwards. So that was uh, a, another injection of confidence, as it were. Um, I, I remember thinking uh, iRobot was, was I was, I was proud of it, but I, I, I remember being at the time much more proud of Pyramid. I said that this album is a, is a great deal better than, than iRobot. But, but um, whenever I'm asked uh, w w what's the favorite album, I always say the first, the Tales of Mystery is, is still my favorite album. I thought I, I like Pyramid because it was a part of it. I, I found Pyramid to be, first of all, I love the cover. I just blown away by the cover. But I, I thought it was more commercial, a little bit more commercial and more palatable for, for me at that, at that time. I don't know. That that was probably Clive Davis's influence. He was always looking for a hit song, you know. And um, I'm not sure the pyramid really ha had a hit song on it. Um, uh, we we uh, certainly did okay with uh, when Iron the Sky came along and uh, and uh, sorry, Friendly Card came along. We had two hits on Friendly Card. Um, By the way, whose idea was it to sing Tail Turn of the Friendly Card? That, that is, I never would have thought. First of all, I would have never told anybody to sing that way, but I would have been wrong because that is just brilliant the way he he sings that chorus. I I, I think that what that was Eric's doing. I mean, his his demo had that essentially that phrasing turn of a friendly car. Yeah, um, yeah. It was it was it was it was a, a nice uh, departure from most uh, from most song phrasing. Mm -hmm. I think it, it worked really well. I'd never heard that before. That Oh, uh, Alan Clark, you come upon that, honestly, because you work with the Hollies. Going back in album, uh, we had Bobby Elliott on the show a little while ago. Uh, Breakdown. Um, oh, yeah, Bobby. Bobby uh, has his book come out? He, his he was book right has been out for about two years. I think it's uh, a year and a half. A year and a half. I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, he, he, uh, he, I think he promised to send me a copy, but I, I never got it. <laughs> He's probably so, juggling. This, Bobby, send me a copy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan Clark, uh, I've, I've called Alan Clark one of my favorite vocalists, and, and you, you utilize him in the project. Um, there, he just has a certain sense to his voice that I, I don't hear on other singers. He's just, you, you know, when I heard The Air That I Breathe, I mean, I almost cried. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just one of those singers. Tell me about Alan Clark, your relationship with him. Well, uh, obviously, I, I did a lot of, must have done three or four albums with the Hollies. Um, so I got to know Alan pretty well. But he, he, um, he jumped at the chance to, 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 to sing Breakdown uh, on our robot. And I think he did a, a fantastic job. I think that's the only song he sang. Isn't it? I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hire him again. I, did, um, I also did uh, songs with Terry Sylvester, who, uh, who was the guy who uh, replaced Graham Nash in the Hollies. Um, Graham Nash left the Hollywood just as just as I joined Abbey Road, so I, I saw him there for one session, and then he was not to be seen again. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to uh, David Henschel uh, a little while ago, a couple of years ago, and, and we were talking about Richard Perry. I'm always interested in producers, and you know, Richard Perry's got this photographic memory. Everyone says, and he's got like nine million loops behind him of reel to reel, and he's not sure which one he's going to pick, but he knows where it is. And I'm going, well, that sounds mm -hmm. like an urban legend. Uh, how do you how do you juggle as a producer? What's your you you must have a system of juggling those cats. Like there's so much going on at one time. Have you trained your mind to be able to do that? I mean that the I don't know. I, I just uh, I act on instinct. Uh, I just uh, add a, a layer or a, an instrument or a backing vocal part or whatever um, according to what I think the song needs. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it uh, it's, it's more more of an engineering question. I think you know uh, how you deal with uh, multiple layers and how you how you mix it. How you how you balance uh, balance the sound. Um, recording engineers at Abbey Road used to be called balance engineers that, because that's what they did. They 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 balanced up the instruments, and um, it was it was a good it was a good good name for it. 
uh, they, they uh, I, I, I'm not sure if they use it these days. I don't, I don't think they do. But uh, that that was the title. You were either a second engineer or a balance engineer. Eye in the Sky, did you know uh, before it was released, did you get a feeling of anything? Man, that I was just getting into radio when that blew up. I mean... <laughs> I've I've never been allowed to forget that I that I wasn't particularly keen on the on the title song. I, uh, I we, we struggled with it uh, when we were recording it, trying to get the right feel, and uh, I I actually proposed dropping it. <laughs> is that the one that people say sounds like the the Lady Annabellum song? Is that is that Eye in the Sky? Yes, people have have said yeah. that. Yeah, and and <laughs> someone said you don't comment on that. Do you don't comment on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just probably be- get it. You could probably guess why I can't comment on it. But. No, but I'm sure someone will tell me after <laughs> this airs why you would. Chris Rainbow, I remember buying Eve and going, oh, my God, who is this wonderful voice? Uh, how far back did, did, well, did you know guy, him? He's the guy that sang Friendly Cock as well. So, I mean, yeah. that, that, so you mentioned uh, um, he, he was always, uh, always welcome in the studio. He, he did some fantastic uh, Backing vocal arrangements. I mean, he he. he I take uh, I take little credit for for his his incredible uh, vocal stacks that he did, uh, but he he he's, he was just a a ridiculously uh, clever guy. He's no longer with us, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, I would have uh, gladly flown him over from the Shetland Islands where he lived um, to uh, to to the states. But uh, no, great talent, and uh, we—I I miss him greatly. Is there anyone in Pink Floyd that you you meshed with the best? That uh, that somehow there's always one or two, right? <laughs> um, I had a little bit of an altercation with Roger Waters recently, who who wasn't happy about me um, playing in, in uh, Tel Aviv in Israel because he's got. Issues with, uh, yeah. with po- politics in the in the Middle East. Um, David Gilmour was always supportive. He he played on one of my albums. He played on an al- uh, my one of my solo albums called The Valid Path. So he's uh, he's always been friendly. And Nick uh, Nick showed up uh, at a masterclass I was doing at Abbey Road, uh, well probably two or three years ago now. And he's coming here. He's coming to Santa Barbara where I live. Uh, in a in a week or so, so I'm going to I'm going to look him up and and uh, ask for some tickets. He, he's he's out with a a show. I think I think that's called The Source of Secrets or something. Yes, like that. So he's still doing it. Believe it or not, after all these years. What what was the difference between McCartney on the two albums you worked with as a Beatle as opposed to McCartney on the first two albums as a solo artist? Was he was he a different person? I I don't think so. Um, I. I obviously knew him much better uh, when I was working with him as as a solo artist. I mean, when I worked with the Beatles, I was you know that's just a pay for operation to pay to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> but um, it, it was uh, you know I, I I enjoyed working with Paul a great deal. I mean, I, I to this day I recognise uh, he's he's you know he's one of the most talented musicians on earth. Really is amazing mm-hmm. guy. Uh, don't answer me. One last one. I know I've got like a thirty seconds here. Don't answer me. Uh, Eric Wolfson, Ammonia Avenue. That that did well in Canada. That album did well in Canada, and that song did really, really well. Um, I, I'm 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 putting words in your mouth. You must have known with that song. Did you, did you know? Um, I it it really came together when we decided to give give it the Phil Spector treatment. You know, smother everything in echo because uh, it, it was very different without that. Um, I think um, I think we've put out, out some bonus tracks um, for for the album that uh, that show what it sounds like without all the echo on it. Um, but I, I was a I was a great uh, great Phil Spector fan. All, all the stuff he did back in the sixty. I've just put an album out uh, called uh, From the New World. Uh, we, we mentioned Vorjak and it includes that Vorjak uh, song, uh, but. It, I felt uh, I, I have felt for years that I would like to do a version of "Be My Baby" by the Ronettes, and we've included that as as the last track on on this new album. I've, put, I've actually put out three uh, t- two studio albums uh, quite recently, and uh, two live albums also came out this year. Um, one in one in Tel Aviv uh, and one in uh, Utrecht in Holland. 
Mm-hmm. The Tel Aviv one is with uh, the Israel Sym- Symphony Orchestra, a Philharmonic Orchestra. So it's uh, I'm rather proud of that. Is your day still filled with music? From how, how much of your day usually on? A, if you're going to just percentage wise, I mean, you you obviously do other stuff, uh, but is music so much part of your your day? Yeah, I mean, it, um, you know the <laughs> the. Uh, my musical career is a business and it, it, you know it, it takes a fair amount of uh, admin time time in the office you know chasing people for money <laughs> a lot of the time um doing interviews you know uh, for new products uh, that, that takes a fair amount of time um i've been working with uh, i've been doing production work in um in the studio uh, with lenny kravitz's drummer his name is franklin vanderbilt uh I've done an album with him uh and uh yeah i mean just just keeping the uh the music alive is is, is quite uh, i'm not quite ready to hang up my hat but it won't be much longer i don't think <laughs> really no seriously because i, no, I just, find just, just for the live for the live shows live shows yeah. are very draining, very draining i mean i love playing live but the, you know the travel is is very draining mm-hmm. is your day still filled with music from um, how much of your day usually on a, if you're going to just percentage wise I mean, you you obviously do other stuff, uh, but is music so much part of your your day? Yeah, I mean, it, um, you know the the uh, my musical career is a business, and it, it, you know it, it takes a fair amount of uh, admin time time in the office. You know, chasing people for money <laughs> a lot of the time, um, doing interviews, you know, uh, for new products uh, that that takes a fair amount of time. Um, I've been working with, uh, I've been doing production work in, um, in the studio, uh, with Lenny Kravitz's drummer, whose name is Franklin Vanderbilt. Uh, I've done an album with him. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just keeping the, uh, the music alive is, is, is quite, uh, uh, nothing else you want to talk about the, the, the new project because, uh, cause I, is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, we got, uh, Tommy Shaw from sticks on a track, um, which which was lovely and um the uh i'm i'm doing i'm doing a, f- a fair amount of uh, singing as well um i'm i'm uh, i'm proud of it it's uh, actually went into the charts in germany for a couple of weeks which is nice is the singing thing like the guitar thing in the beginning where you're inching your way towards that i mean because someone had asked one of the fans had asked why didn't he sing more and someone else had said well i don't know if he knew he could but what's what's the answer to that i think i've just got better at it and more more, more confident um in in the studio um this you know the the studio environment you can you can do take after take until it until it's perfect uh, i'm i'm more more concerned uh, that that People might not say I'm a great singer in, in uh, the live uh, shows, but uh, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that uh, that I can do the job. Another, another name to mention for the new album is Joe Bonamat. Um, we got we got we got him to play play. Uh, Sorry, you cut out there. What, who was it? Uh, Joe Joe Bonamassa is oh. is playing solos and uh, on on the album. Uh, uh, we we met uh, earlier this year, and he actually interviewed me at the uh, Nashville. Hall of Fame, and uh, uh, at the end of the interview, I said, I, "I've got one question for you." And he said, "Yeah, well, what is it? Will you play on my new album?" He said, "Yes." <laughs> so that's how you ask him? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else had asked us. He had asked that. Uh, would there ever be? Um, and I know you've worked with newer artists. An Alan Parsons album with n- only new artists. Uh, you mean people that, that have never. Well, with, people you and I aren't supposed to be listening to, because <laughs> people always say singers, that. Too. You mean singers or every every or every musician as well? And, 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 either or, uh, and, and or. Hmm. Uh, it's a possibility, I guess. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Tommy Shaw had never appeared uh, w- with me before, n- nor had Joe Bonamassa, but uh, so. I, I think there's always going to be, uh, as long as I'm making records, there's always going to be new blood coming in. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. Remember, you can support our channel. You can make a donation via PayPal, or you can join our Patreon and get early access to all our videos. Like our videos, subscribe to our channel, share them on social media, and remember, we read all the comments. I'm John Bogan. This is Rocky Street Book. Mm-hmm.